seminar. So it, we call it a special seminar, but uh, I'm delighted that uh, we have uh, with us uh, planning to see Luisa uh, Campagnolo, a uh, long time collaborators, friends, uh, working on nanoparticles of all sorts for how many years? For 10 years? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, they are both world uh, renowned in the field. I, I'm going to keep my introductions uh, short because uh, I'm going to do that in favor. Uh, now the bias case, you can Google them. Uh, anyway, I've been playing uh, in uh, inhalation toxicologist, calling it sorry, inhalation toxicologist, like he does a lot of other things. Uh, he's an editor in chief um, of uh, particle fiber toxicology, one of the leading journals in this field. Um, and um, um, part of many uh, uh, consortia in Europe on uh, air pollution and also engineer nanoparticles and nanomaterials. Very uh, recently, shaped by design and sustainable materials. Uh, he's a professor also um, in the Netherlands and chief science officer at uh, RIDN, which is the National Institute of Health and Environment in the Netherlands. Um, then Prisa, she, is, she comes uh, from the uh, university, uh, from the medical school at the University of Rome. Um, uh, her research interests are primarily in uh, histology and development of theaters and more other things. And, <coughs> molecular mechanisms related to the development of the center, and of course, studies environmental uh, chemicals and particles. So you will hear a lot about nanoparticles of all sorts of things. And um, with that, and without um, <coughs> no further ado, um, uh, let's manage to start here. All right, good. Thanks, thank you, Phil, for the introduction, and uh, thanks for all showing up here, and also uh, you know, that there are people online. Um, so it's kind of a challenge to capture all the things that I'm involved in. Um, just to let you know, I'm, I do have an appointment at the university, but I'm primarily working at the National Institute of Gov Health, Public Health and the Environment, which is governmental institute, which is kind of a combination between EPA, CDC, NIRS, a little bit of FDA. So you can see a little bit where I'm going from. It's quite diverse. And one of our prime task is to translate science to policy and regulations and the other way around. So that's, for us it's very important to be involved in many different projects, many have a quite network, that's why also my interest is, is quite important. So today I will focus on, um, on ultrafine particles, um, I would say I'm an inhalation toxicologist, focusing on particles and fibers. And um, I mean, it already starts with the fact that if you look at the epidemiology of particles, they have consistent association across the world, irrespective of the chemical composition. But yet, as toxicologists, you know that composition matters, but also that, that size matters. And for those that are not really yet into the field of, of uh, particles, and we, we do have size distributions in the air. We have coarse particles. You can still inhale them, but they're not really reaching our lower airways and our lungs. And there's fine particles. And more also from anthropogenic source, and then the ultrafine part. Recording in progress. That's good. <laughs> um, so, and, and the ultrafine particles that are really released from mostly from combustion processes or secondary formation out of gases in, in the air. They don't add a lot to the total mass that we inhale, but they do are quite dominant in terms of particle number. So, um, so. Um, there's, there's a huge size range there, from 10 micrometer based on aerodynamics that you can inhale up down to one, one nanometer. So I, I just want to give a, a few examples demonstrating why particle size matters. Um, very simple, if you inhale a micro-sized particle at a certain concentration, let's say X, um, few particles will even still reach the alveoli. And there's this macrophage, which is, of course, our natural vacuum cleaner. It's there to get rid of everything that doesn't belong there. And particles, if there are only a few of them, um, then that macrophage is very well capable of finding those particles, uh, phagocytizing them, and either they digest them or they just uh, keep them in there, etc. So there's a good protection mechanism. But if you have the same external concentration, X, 
Uh, and you look at nano-sized particles, whether it's ultrafine or engineered particles, there are many more particles, and a couple of things happen. First of all, nano-sized particles are not well recognized by macrophages, uh, certainly if they're single, so you need to have aggregates, and then it starts to be recognized, and macrophages will take, will take place. But because they're so more abundant, there's a lot more opportunities and likelihood those particles interact with the epithelial layer, and all other things can happen that can mean that they can attack the epithelial cells, they can, upon um, uh, inhalation, they can pass in between the cells, uh, they can go into the bloodstream, they go into interstitium, uh, many more uh, uh, mechanisms are present there. So, specifically, if you look at engineered part of the nanomart, uh, particles, if you look at the their same chemical composition, um, and toxicologists always think that the chemical itself makes the makes the uh, the poison, but here it's the size that matters, and you do get the same chemistry, but you get a different dose, different dose rate, and also these particles have opportunities to reach other organs. So this is an overview of what you should know if you look at uh, particle and fiber toxicology. Um, it's important that you have good understanding about their position. If you're using in vitro models, eh, it doesn't make sense to use very large particles in an alveolar model because they ha have a high likelihood to reach the alveolar spaces. You need to have some understanding about clearance mechanisms because we're well, not fully really stuffed with, with particles. Eh? We have mechanisms how they, they clear, and that balance should be uh, okay. Eh? I mean, if it's imbalanced, then, uh, then you get the pathology happening. Uh, and then how particles distribute uh, across the body to have a good understanding of, should I also test my uh, particle in liver model or in, in any in kidney model, whatever. And if the particles don't reach that organ, it doesn't make sense to do any toxicity studies on that. So, um, and, and of course, if you look at outer particles, there are many different sources uh, that uh, produce nanoparticles. So, one of the first areas that we explored, because initially you think if you inhale something, the effects will occur in the lung. Well, our lung are evolutionary, very well developed to handle particles and also gases. So, um, but uh, we worked together with cardiologists in Edinburgh, and they were very interested in doing human studies. So, and we have to facilitate uh, facilitate um, facilities to, to do that kind of studies. We have mobile units, so we bring them to Scotland. And there we do exposure. So there was the, the, the question, okay, what is it doing on cardiovascular effects? And that was already work that we've done. Now you can see that in, in 2010 and, and, and later on. And you can come up with all kinds of mechanisms. What can happen if particles uh, reach the blood uh, having direct effects? I mean, it can, may have an interaction with uh, atherotic uh, plaques. Uh, they may uh, cause a release of NO or change the balance there, and they may also have an, uh, an impact on, on the heart. And that would kind of also explain again the epidemiological observations for, uh, for particles where they do see uh, cardiovascular events associated with being exposed to air pollution. So one of the nice studies that we've done uh, was an intervention study. Uh, the question by that time was, quite pragmatic, uh, the government wants to introduce particle traps for diesel vehicles, and there are many more diesel vehicles in Europe than you have here in, in the US. Um, and the question was, is that indeed uh, very effective? Well, here we had an, a model where we exposed volunteers for two hours to dilute uh, diesel exhaust, which is very rich in ultrafine particles. <laughs> and uh, we noticed that that exposure um, is quite high in terms of 300 microgram per cubic meter for two hours, but that kind of averages out for 20, 24 hour average to being the uh, same as the standard for PM. Uh, you, you see an increase in thrombus formation. Uh, the, the, there's always thrombus formation in, in our body, but there's also a breakdown. And there's, if, as long as it's in good equilibrium, there's nothing wrong there. But if there's an increase, there's a risk of getting stroke and all kinds of other uh, adverse effects. But then when we introduced the particle traps, you see that with, if, you, if you filter out those particles, uh, you don't see the effects. So the effects were here not contributed, uh, 
uh, we're not related to the gas state, but only to the particulates. <coughs> uh, and despite the fact that here we see that the these are catalytic filters, so they increase also the levels of, uh, of, uh, of NOx. Um, so then we went on and said, well, is it what exactly is causing it in that complex mixture? Is it the gas itself? Is it the particle? Is it stuff absorbed from the particle? So we did a, a four way crossover design where we exposed volunteers diluted exhaust uh, from diesel engines. We had a group uh, where we filtered out the particles. We had a group with only particles and then, of course, a sham control. So each volunteer was exposed four times, two weeks into in between. Um, and then you can look at all kinds of uh, measures. This is an ex actually an ex vivo uh, way to measure the contraction of blood vessels. Right? When you have an, um, uh, an, an aorta of pig actually and you infuse them with the blood from the volunteer. And you can look at the contraction using vanilla afrin. Um, and then for the um, controls, uh, you do see that there's nicely an increase in the in the contraction, but if you have the carbon particles or diesel, there's the, a stronger uh, contraction. Uh, but here there is a difference between the diesel and carbon particles, so that would say that there's something ongoing with with the particles. Um, but at the same time, if you look at, for instance, block plotting, it was only the complete mixture of diesel particles with all the chemicals absorbed on the surface. That causes, for instance, mm -hmm. decreased capacity to handle blood clotting, um, and, and not with the filtered exhaust and not with carbon particles. So he would conclude that particles alone, is, if they are kind of chemically inert, don't cause that effect. So you really have that um, <coughs> surface area that it, where all kinds of components are absorbed on the surface. And, and yeah, you can hypothesize then that is the absorbed stuff on the older pines. And ultrafines are there only to carry the more toxic components or the uh, to the to the targets. But still, the question was: Are the particles actually reaching the blood, or is it something happening still in in the lungs uh, that causes, for instance, inflammation, oxidative stress, radiators are released that would affect the cardio the, the vascular system. So. Carbon particles at that time were very difficult to detect and identify in, in, uh, in tissues. So, that, well, let, let's use gold particles. Uh, easy to trace, easy to generate in a very small size, and, and, we, and, and, and also in large numbers. So here we had um, volunteers again exposed for two hours. Every 50 minutes, they always have to do a little bit more exercise to increase the deposition. And then we collected um, blood and urine, and we at the same time did a parallel study in, in mice where we could use uh, a couple of more sizes. So what we've noticed is that uh, you see that there is an increase of uh, these small particles in the blood, and that's size related. If you have 18 nanometer particles or 50 nanometer particles, there's a clear difference here. I mean, in, in both cases, you do see that these particles end up in the blood. But here you see in, uh, uh, an um, accumulation. So this tells you that there's a size dependence, but also that there's probably a lot deposited in the lung, but there's a very slow clearance and release into, into the blood. So your lung can act as a reservoir for those small particles and this continuous exposure of all other organs. Now, we've confirmed that also in, in mice, where you can do a little bit more. Uh, in depth investigation, uh, more size ranges. Again, you see that size related increase. Uh, the smaller the particles, the more particles end up in the blood, in the liver, but also in the urine. And for this one, it's, if you look at two hour exposure, still after four weeks, but even after three months, we could detect uh, gold in urine. So that's kind of scary, but keep in mind, we have very high levels of exposure. I mean, or five million particles per cubic centimeter. So the size dependent particle <laughs> concentration. Still, you can argue, um, yeah, but gold can, even under certain conditions, if they end up in the lysosome, some may dissolve. So you detect the dissolved gold because this was ICPMS. 
Then we had an opportunity that people go for surgery uh, because uh, the plaque in the carotids uh, that blood, blood vessel have, will be removed uh, to avoid that you get a stroke or any other uh, disease. Uh, that's a kind of routine procedure. So we said, well, um, let's expose these people the day before surgery. And then we take out that, uh, that plaque and we analyze the plaque. So you can, uh, this is that, that uh, plaque that you can take out and non-exposed did not show any, any gold. But if you have um, exposed volunteers, we could detect particles here. This is the Roman uh, spectrum. Yeah, the, the red one here is uh, what you could see in, uh, in the tissue. And uh, the black one is pure gold particles on the glass slide, just to confirm that we have the same spectrum. So here we, I think we've demonstrated quite convincingly that nano-sized gold particles end up in, in the blood and actually seem to accumulate in a little bit more fatty type of, of tissue. Um, another study, not by us, um, but uh, by Wolfgang Kreiling, his group in Germany, uh, then also showed in animals that were exposed to, um, I think this was iridium, uh, that is uh, a size dependency in terms of translocation. But here they could also measure it in uterine wall, placenta, amniotic fluid, uh, fluids, and also in fetuses. And that's, uh, but you really have to have very, very small particles. And they use uh, isotope labeling. So uh, it's not that they measure something like backgrounds here. It was really what they uh, had, uh, had used in their exposures. Um, not, not that long ago, a Belgian group in Hasselt uh, uh, thought they, uh, no, they had developed a technique where they actually could detect carbon particles in tissues. And the first study was an epidemiological study where they collected uh, placentas um, from uh, women that lived in a let's say a polluted area or an, an area which is less polluted uh, and, and use that to see if there's a relationship between the carbon particles that they could detect in these tissues and the expected level of exposure that they had uh, during uh, pregnancy. And there was, I mean, this, of course, there's a lot of noise around it because there are all kinds of other feet, uh, aspects that, that uh, influence this, but there was a correlation here. But also interesting, there was a correlation with the gestation duration. The, the, the shorter the gestation duration, the higher the, the number of particles uh, that were seen in, in placenta. So that may also have a relationship with uh, preterm birth uh, as such. Um, the issue with the technique is you cannot exactly determine the, the size of the particles. I mean, it's, they know it's less than 100 nanometers, but the technique okay. will uh, it's, it's, it's not that discriminative. So I found out about this technique and said, well, we've done a study in pregnant rabbits in France at the INRA Institute, uh, where we exposed those rabbits again to diesel exhaust, rich in particles, uh, where we also looked under the microscope to see if we could uh, see those uh, particles. But yeah, you, you never know for sure if it's the particles from the diesel exhaust or that there was another source. Uh, the, the, the setup of that study was uh, uh, that we exposed them for two hours a day, five days a week, and which is not that easy in rabbits. They're quite stressful animals, and certainly if they are pregnant. So you have to do a lot of training before you can do this type of uh, studies. And then um, uh, the, and, but the advantage of having the rabbit is that you can do ultrasonic um, analysis so you can measure fetuses and, and those kinds of parameters and, and that was followed up as well i mean a couple of papers out of that but don't want to emphasize too much we, we do see effects due to the exposure again this is just like source it contains both gases and particles uh, but there was an impact uh, of uh, for instance vascularization index uh, and and the vascularization flow uh, when these animals were exposed um, and also, the, the, actually, the first reason why we did the study is that epidemiology, epidemiology shows that um, in polluted areas, these indicators were also uh, affected. I mean, things like uh, birth weight, but also head legs, etc. So we could confirm these findings in an experimental study uh, from epidemiology. 
uh, based on the epidemiology. So we had still had those tissues, so I sent them to Belgium, and they used that uh, technique to analyze those particles. And that's, that's using femtosecond pulsar laser elimination, very fancy. It's, you have to look under the microscope, and then you see uh, the white spots appearing in the, in the green background. Um, and they quantify and uh, the, 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 these particles. So in those rabbits, uh, we've had uh, placenta, but we had fetuses, and we could analyze all the different parts in the fetuses as well. And in sometimes this is not very convincing because okay, you see white spot, but is that really true? But I can tell you there's a lot more uh, than than these pictures to demonstrate it. But particles were noted in placenta, but also in fetal heart, kidney liver and also in the lungs um, and if you quantify them uh, obviously uh, the levels in placenta are quite high compared to the controls uh, but here fetal heart kidney you all see that there is an increase not that much in in the lung but well the lung doesn't really uh, work that uh, that well uh, where in, in the unborn uh, and well in the fetal gonads it's not, not that convincing but I think this was a very elegant study, which is now still under review, where we demonstrate that very small nano-sized uh, carbon particles can also reach all the different tissues in, in fetus. So that is, and, and Louisa will tell you a little bit more about other types of work in, in this area, but this is one direction of, of our research, uh, looking at the, uh, the, the combination of Inhalation cardiovascular, but also at uh, the uh, second generation or first generation uh, type of studies. Um, Phil didn't give me too much time. I would love to tell you about our work on neurodegeneration, but I think, well, let's decide what I would do. I think I would tell you a little bit more about our work on uh, aircrafts, uh, because that's an interesting source of ultrafine particles. Well, it's not well studied. I mean, epidemiology more or less relies on. PM data. Um, now, there's not that much data on particles, numbers, or will defines anyhow. Some studies have been done in, in Europe. Um, but here was a really a question that, um, well, we have an increase in, in uh, transport through, through air, um, and you get all kinds of emissions. And at some point, there was a study done in Amsterdam where they said, well, we do measure particles that are that small, they should have come from uh, turbine engines. We mentioned them in downtown Amsterdam. For your impression, um, the uh, international airport is about 15 kilometers from downtown. So 15 kilometers away from the source, you measure um, particles that were detected, uh, identified as those from aviation. Um, so obviously, you get concern from the public. And the way it works for us at RFEM is that if that reaches the media, uh, you would see all these publications, members of parliament would start questions to our Ministry of Environment, and the Ministry of Environment would usually respond, um, not sure yet. We asked RFEM to sort it out, in, and you get the answer in 90 days, because you have to respond within 90 days to parliament. Well, you can all imagine that that's not possible to find out if you don't have any data. Um, so it was a bit of a negotiation. And then finally, we set up a five-year program doing a lot of work on around the airport. Now, Schiphol Airport, Amsterdam Airport, is complicated in the center. You have six runways, and they go in all different directions, depending not only on the wind direction, but also on the noise contours. And this was the initial idea. This is Amsterdam. This is the airport. and they. They, they saw that the highest uh, number of very small particles were coming uh, from the direction of the airport, 18 kilometers. Um, but um, so we had to set up a, a research program where we included toxicology, epidemiology, a lot of exposure assessment. And for the toxicology, it was basically the question, are particles from turbine engines, from aviation, are they more or less toxic than the ones from road traffic? Um, because that, that helps the policymakers to make decisions and set priorities. I mean, if they would be 10 times more potent, then it would shift their priorities. If they would say, okay, they're equally potent, okay, then the problem is probably only around the airport, but not throughout the country. You only have one big airport in the country. 
Um, so, um, but on the one hand, toxicology using in vitro models to compare from different sources, and I'll show you data from that. Um, on the other hand, epidemiology, different types of designs. Um, but in between, we thought, oh, let's let's also work again with with volunteers. So we moved our mobile app to the airport. I can tell you that's a logistic nightmare uh, because they complain about safety issues, about security issues. So to get on the on the airport itself is close to impossible. So we positioned it right at the edge of, of the airport. And um, the design was that healthy volunteers, young volunteers, went to the hospital. Uh, they had uh, a full analysis of lung and heart function, a questionnaire, exhaled breath, and uh, we standardized their, their diet. And then they went in a, in a car, which was filtered. So they had inside a 15 minute drive to the location. And then they went into the lab for five hours and every 20 minutes they had to cycle. And uh, we monitored, of course, what their exposure was. And then they went back in that same car and exactly the same measurements. And also the next day, we've collected urine for doing metabolomics. So um, here you see the airport. This was the mobile unit, volunteers inside there. We have a prevailing southwesterly wind. And so that means that the winds come in this direction. So we positioned our lab over there, thinking, OK, most of the times we will collect particles from the airports. And I can tell you, if you do field studies, it always goes different than you <laughs> predict. Because at that summer, yeah, the wind coming from the east, from the north, but never from the south <laughs> and south uh, southwest. And we had high temperatures as well. So instead of doing uh, a study over two months, we extended it over five months. What we need to capture that source. And here you see two three ways um, that was kind of the reference being the, the road traffic um, in terms of particle numbers um, highest levels were 170,000 uh, particles per cc for a five hour average here in this room phil what do you think 4,000 5,000 particles maybe 10,000 if everybody starts eating etc but that's about it so it's it's quite large it's it's, it's, it's substantial but we had good contrast as well. And then we measured, of course, all the other pollutants that, that uh, are of any relevance. So the health indicators, spirometry, exhaled and O, ECG, and meta, uh, uh, metalome analysis. I'm going to show you data on that. So this is typically what epidemiologists tend to prefer. Huge state of a lot of data and all these correlations. I'm not an epidemiologist, but this was presented to me. So what, what you see here is, and I squared it red here, is uh, that lung function was decreased if you associate with particle numbers in a single pollutant model, but also if you adjust for all the other uh, indicators like black carbon and N2, that uh, association remains statistically significant. And the same was for one parameter of the ECG, which is indicative of risk for, uh, for ventricular dysrhythmia. And, and sudden death. Well, these are healthy people, so that's not that I mean, the size is not that that strong, but uh, it, it tells you a little bit what can happen if you maybe have a repeated exposure. Um, and for black carbon, which is not an indicator for turbine engine particles because they are not that black, um, we see association with with blood pressure, and that's I think quite well known uh, for this indicator. And we saw an association also with NOx. So this is really more an indicator of road traffic, and this would be more uh, linked to, to aviation. And why do I say that? Because if you separate the particles in size and take the number of particles below 20 nanometers, and turbine engine particles are 10 to 20 nanometers, roughly speaking, and they, they don't seem to grow very fast over time. Um, and uh, if you take that as the indicator for aviation, and compare it with particles larger than 50 nanometers, and you really know that this is road traffic and other sources. Um, the association uh, for these two indicators remain more or less the same, but was much stronger uh, for the smaller particles compared to uh, the, the somewhat larger particles, or even uh, was reversed in, in this case for that ECG. So we did a lot of 
another analysis, we did source apportionment that also confirmed that it was mainly from takeoff aircrafts and not landing aircrafts, uh, because there's a difference also in, in the, the, the type of pollution that is caused uh, by these events. But overall, the summary of the entire uh, program was that, um, yeah, well, we do see, uh, oh, there, there was another study, an epidemiological study in, in school children, north and south of the airport, and they, they just looked at all kinds of measures. Um, and here they did not see any difference between UFP from particle, from aircraft or from road traffic, medication use, maybe a little bit on lung function, but that was more related to road traffic. Uh, so from, from that children's study, we did not have any good indications uh, that these particles were made to be different. The uh, volunteer studies said, well, maybe for aircraft, we do see a little bit more, um, but the number of observations are not that, that large that you can really be convinced that they do see major uh, differences there. Um, and from the toxicological analysis, we could say, okay, we do see exactly the same type of effects. The potency may differ a little bit, but not to the extent that you would say, okay, these are 10 times more toxic or 10 times less toxic. Um, eventually, they also finished up a long-term exposure study, and that's from, for us, is the most relevant one, because then you have continuous exposure data over a five-year period uh, for a population of 1.7 million around the airport, so it's substantial. I only give you the summary and not all the epidemiological tables here. Um, but um, you can see it here from, from the conclusions, no indications that ultrafines only from aircrafts, by the way. This, the, the, the problem here was we only had information about the dispersion of particles from the airport around the airport, but we did not have any data of the ultrafines from the background. Uh, so um, this is only on top of what the effects already could have been from uh, being exposed to the rest of the air pollution. So there's no extra effect caused by these ultrafine particles from the airport um, on respiratory disease uh, disorders, cardiovascular, birth outcomes, neurological effects. There's some suggestive evidence. That, that means that even if you have 1.7 million people, there are indications, um, but it's still what they call, uh, these are the, I think these are the used EPA criteria, suggestive evidence uh, and insufficient evidence. Um, so here you would say, okay, is there really a problem with the airport emissions for, for the population living around that area? Well, it's not very strong, but here we, we also concluded this is just one airport um, and you need to do these studies at, at multiple airports as, as have been done for PM and, and noise in, in the past as well. Um, so uh, yeah, well, on the other end, I would say, I'm glad that we don't see these effects yeah? because we're all exposed to these particles. So if we would see strong effects, then you would really be worried and there is a, a big concern. So uh, to conclude here, um, there are differences in toxicity among the sources. I mean, if you look at combustion derived particles, they're definitely more potent than, let's say, um, a um, titanium dioxide particle, uh, which is chemically not that very reactive. Um, Short-term exposures to high levels of ultrafines are associated with some de decreased lung function uh, in healthy volunteers. So here we also talk with clinicians. So how relevant do you think it is? Well, they think it's for single exposure, it doesn't really matter because we always saw that the effects were uh, completely uh, returned back to normal levels the next day or the day after. So it seems to be reversible. But if you're exposed every day, every day you get a hit, then at some point it will cause an adverse effect and then you get an accumulation. Um, so, uh, and, and so both for the heart and, and lung function, etc. So in, in essence, it's very plausible that ultrafine particles can affect heart, Brain, I didn't show the data, and even cross placenta. Um, to what extent, you can say, is there really a risk that is unacceptable? I think we're not really there yet. Uh, that we, we accumulate the evidence, 
it's it's a pity that we don't have a lot of information on all to find for epidemiological analysis, but that will come in particularly in Europe uh, because the WHO uh, concluded that they need a lot more information to set guideline values for all to find. The European Commission is stimulating research on that area, so we will see that in the, in the near future. With that, I think I summarized a little bit of our work. I can tell you a lot more, but still only gave me 20, 25 minutes. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Thank you, Fleming. Uh, thank you for questions. We give uh, the podium to uh, Luisa, and she's going to switch gear and talk about the maternal exposure in our parking lot, and then we come back and bombard them with questions. Uh, let you, do, you want, do you want your presentation? No, I'm going over yeah, yours. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I can give another interpretation of your data. Maybe the knowledge. So, well, my, okay, here we So, um, of course, thank you, Phil, for uh, the opportunity to share with you guys some of the work uh, we are doing at my university, in my laboratory in Rome at Tor Vergata. And um, so I'm going to talk today about what we have done over the last, I would say, 15 years about um, maternal exposure to nanoparticles and i will focus mainly on engineer nanoparticles so i did not include a specific slide on what engineer nanoparticles are because i give it for granted that you all know the outstanding work that that phil has done over the years so um you know it's we are talking about something very small below 100 nanometers that has been purposely made uh you know for you know increasing the, the, the features of specific uh, uh products so what i would like i mean I, i'm really happy to know that um, most of the audience know uh well what i'm talking about but i would like to make clear why we have been interested in looking at the developmental effects of engineered nanoparticles. I think that most of you know very well that pregnancy can, can be considered um, a, a peculiar condition of increased susceptibility because of an increased metabolic demand on the maternal side and an increased cellular proliferation and finally regulated differentiation processes which characterize embryophytal development. And David Barker uh, said that we basically are what we are exposed in utero. So this is at the base of the so-called uh, um, developmental origin of health and diseases, uh, which is summarized in this cartoon. Um, if I mean, that there might be many stressors uh, during pregnancy, which may um, induce either an immediate response. And in this immediate response, the strongest effect would be in utero death. So that's it. Or a less uh, severe effect would be in utero growth restriction. On the other hand, there could be a response, an adaptive response. And so this would allow I would say fairly normal development, but then at birth, it ends up with a, a, a baby with a low birth weight. And these two conditions in utero growth restrictions and low birth weight have been associated to increased risks to develop metabolic diseases later in adulthood. This has been uh, assessed uh, studying individuals uh, that experienced the Dutch famine during the Second World War, and you know, there, there was as, uh, observed that, that there was an increased risk uh, for this. So then uh, our hypothesis was that maybe uh, engineered nanomaterials could be part of these stressors um, affecting pregnancy. And that's because, I mean, we are exposed uh, quite a bit to to these particles through uh, food, to uh, uh, cosmetics, and, and many other consumer products. So, um, well, the main question was if these particles can affect 
development, would they do it directly? Uh, you know, reaching the, the fetus and impairing development, or would they just be retained in the placenta? So in the case of a direct fetal uh, effect, we would uh, observe you know, evident developmental effects, but again, uh, the, the particles could remain, could, could accumulate in the placental tissue and induce placental effects. Uh, I don't think that it really makes much of a difference in terms of the effect in the, the, the general effect, the outcome, because we know that the fetus is completely relying on the wellness of the placenta in order to correctly develop. So I think it's relevant to know if there is or not translocation, but if we just look at the outcome, then it doesn't really uh, uh, makes much of a difference. So, but still, we try to assess, you know, each of these steps. So, uh, many years ago, this was actually our one of our first studies. We used uh, fluorescently labeled uh, single wall carbon nanotubes, and we we labeled them because that at that time that was the only way of identifying carbon in carbon. Um, and we administered these particles to mice, to pregnant mice, early in gestation. So at 5.5 days post coitum, which means that the placenta is still not there. Uh, or later in gestation and mid gestation. Uh, have, so, and, and we looked at the uh, deposition 24 hours after. And as you can see here, I mean, this was uh, a mouse uterus in which each of the implantation site was very brightly uh, identified by the particles. Uh, later in gestation, we were able to dissect uh, the fetus and the placentas. And what we observed actually that most of the fluorescence was in the fetal membranes. Uh, and these are placentas from both the, the fetal and the maternal side. So we could see a bit of fluorescence in the placentas, but no fluorescence in, in fetuses. However, I mean, that was really inconclusive because this is definitely not such a, a, a sensitive technique. So we couldn't actually really say if few particles uh, reached or not the fetus. Um, this is actually something that, that Fleming already showed. So I just hide it. <laughs> the second part, but this this was actually to show that, I mean, if we use other particles, different composition, uh, different size, I mean, you can see here the, the carbon nanotubes we used were of a, I would say, very consistent uh, size, but I mean, here you can see how small particles would reach and deposit in the placenta more than bigger particles. And now you, you know the rest, but I will get back anyway to it. So, and um, so I think this was already an indication. And I would say that, you know, even before doing the, these experiments, we would have guessed that, you know, if you administer something, these were actually uh, IV injections. If you administer something in the blood, to a pregnant animal, you will definitely see uh, the material in the placenta because the placenta is one of the most highly vascularized organs. So uh, blood would, would bring whatever over there. So the question then was, um, what if we are exposed to nanoparticles to a different route, for example, inhalation? And this is actually a study that we performed together with Fleming in which we administer we exposed by nose only exposure uh, pregnant pregnant mice from the first day of pregnancy up to the 15th day so you know that a mouse i mean the gestation lasts about 19 20 days so so this exposure was organized in a way that we could uh, reproduce a potential human exposure into the uh, 
allowed limits, uh, which was what we call the low exposure rate, one hour per day for the 15 consecutive days, or a fourfold higher exposure. And what we observed is that, okay, we saw, of course, uh, uh, particles in the placenta. This is an analysis done with single particle ICPMS, which allowed to identify not just the silver, but also the particles themselves to, to quantitate the particles. So we, we found particles in lung, spin, and liver, but you can see also a bit of particles were identified in the placentas. And actually, we also did some TEM analysis, and you can see these are red blood cells, which are very nicely decorated by, by the particles. And this is a, a cell, a trophoblast cell, with a mitochondrium stuffed with particles. And we performed uh, EDX analysis to confirm that those particles were indeed made of silver. Of course, there are other studies, and actually this is a study done by, by Phoebe, uh, in which, you know, with other particles in inhaled, uh, again, we can see deposition in, in trophoblast cells. So, I mean, we can conclude that, uh, and I mean, there are now many other studies also performed after uh, particle ingestion, which shows that also through the GI tract, uh, the placenta can, can be reached. So what happens if the particles get to the placenta? Well, this is our very first study in which, again, here we used single world carbon nanotubes, which were not labeled, but were uh, oxidized in, in order to, to change uh, the surface charge. And uh, what we observed comparing placentas from different liters, that we could see uh, uh, an impairment in vascularization of the placentas. Uh, the placentas were looking, you see, very whitish. And we also could identify through the azar mallory staining the deposition of fibrin cloth uh, in, the, in the tissue. And we also measured uh, the, the oxidative stress. And we could see that, especially with the ultra oxidized single work carbon nanotubes, uh, we, we had uh, quite a bit of oxidative stress in the tissue. Similar data were confirmed by others. This is a, another, also another very early study from a Japanese group, which actually, actually identified um, apoptosis in, in the placentas, and they, they also saw, as in our cases, the, the formation of clots. And in our silver study, we measured the uh, uh, expression of inflammatory cytokines uh, in, the, in the placentas from the exposed animals, and you can see that this, there is a nice uh, dose response a relationship in terms of the expression of TNF alpha and IL1 beta, uh, uh, indicating that you know there was a an pro-inflammatory effect uh, of the particles. So then, question is translocation: the part, do the particles stay into the placenta or do they reach the fetus? Well, uh, in the silver study, we did single particle ICPMS also on placental tissues. But as you can see here, we could identify silver ions, but not particles. So the guy that helped us doing the analysis uh, said, you know, it's probably we are too below the detection limit of the instrument, also because the size of the particles were at the very limit because our particles, the, the particles we produced, these were actually freshly produced particles of about 20 to 25 nanometers. But you know, said, you know, we are at the limit. So we were kind of disappointed. Uh, but then we did some time analysis. And actually, in some areas of the fetuses, we could identify particles that through uh, EDS were actually made of silver. So
So we could see particles of the expected size uh, in the feet of fish. Very few. I mean, we had to go through a lot of slides, but still. So, so this would say clearly that there is translocation, but the translocation is very low. There's just a very little amount going across. And as you can see, there are these are just very few of the, the, the most recent studies that show um, translocation. Okay. And this is actually the study that, that Fleming uh, was showing before, you know, showing also the, the thesis. And uh, so this study not only shows translocation, but also again tells us an important thing that is about size. You know, the bigger the particles, the less translocation you have. Uh, so we tried with, uh, I would say, fairly complicated approach to identify other potential physical chemical properties that were regulating placental translocation besides size. So we used uh, uh, silica nanoparticles, amorphous silica nanoparticles of three sizes with two different surface uh, modifications, so positively and negatively charged particles. And we performed a study, I mean, we, we administered the mice, uh, I would say, fairly high uh, dose of particles, but that because we wanted to be able to, to trace them using uh, ICPAS, and we administered the particles at three different gestational stages. Because, I mean, it, 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 the variability should change according to the gestational stage. And the, the, the more closer to time you get, the more permissive the placenta becomes. So what we observed is what you see here. So it was not trivial at all to associate physicochemical characteristics. Uh, so the, the clear data is that basically administration toward them is what drives the uh, translocation of almost all the particles. I mean, we only couldn't detect the smaller carboxylated particles, but we could detect all the others. Okay. So I think you know, there are so many uh, um, things going around that it's not really so trivial to identify specifically one characteristic uh, or another. And this is just to give you an idea of the effects. So either they stay in the placenta or they translocate. I mean, we could see, uh, this is our very first study in which we could identify a lot of different phenol malformations affecting the the fetus is, um, and we could also see this the ROS production in the fetus, is not just in the placenta. This is the Japanese group paper in which you know they administered silver, um, sorry, silica, titania, fullerens, and they could uh, identify effects only for some type of particles, but not for others. And in general, they, they show the uh, growth restriction. And here you can see uh, using quantum dots, the, the, the uh, skeletal malformations that, that were observed. And in our silver study, we could see that in the higher dose uh, exposure, uh, there was an uh, increased rate of in utero uh, death. So uh, just to summarize this first part, um, I think it's clear that, I mean, if, if the particles can make it to the blood circulation, independently of, you know, which route of exposure you use, well, they will end up in the placenta. That there is definitely translocation, but translocation in general is extreme. I mean, it occurs at very low extent. Definitely size influences translocation. There might be other uh, physical chemical properties, which, however, as I showed you, it's not so trivial to associate 
together. And um, the, the either it's a direct or it's an indirect effect. I mean, we could see increased inflammation, oxidative stress, and vascular damage as, as an effect. So over the last three, four years, we concentrated in developing non-animal approaches to, to study uh, nanoparticle translocation of blood, uh, of the blood placental barrier. And um, I mean, there, there, there are already many out. I mean, the, the reason for, for doing these non-animal approaches is mainly due to the fact, well, first of all, it's, you know, we are trying to go toward the 3R, reduce, replace, and refine approach and plus um, there are species specific differences in the placental structure which do not allow to automatically transfer what you find in a mouse to a human okay so um, I mean the several groups have used this uh, ex vivo human placenta perfusion model which is very useful to study translocation uh, you know, you can put something in the maternal circuit and see if you find it in the fetal circuit. Uh, it's a very good system. However, it only allows for short-term studies, few hours, and it doesn't give any indication about the fetal effects. It's just about translocation. So there are other models, in vitro models. You know, this, uh, this is the typical trans well a model which allows you to replicate a sort of placental barrier by putting uh, oligocarcinoma cells, uh, endothelial cells, and, and so on. Again, I mean, also in this case, I mean, this, you know, this is the, the easiest way, but then you can include any other sort of cell that would is relevant to, to replicate the placental barrier. But again, in this case, again, you have no information about the, the effects on the fetuses. So what we developed uh, a few years ago is a, a system in which we used um, pre-implantation embryos and we took out uh, trophoblast stem cells from the, these embryos. And then we used embryonic stem cells derived from inner cell mass in order to have the two components uh, so we put the trophoblast stem cells on top to replicate the placental barrier, and we differentiated the embryonic stem cells into embryoid bodies. These embryoid bodies are these little balls that recapitulate in vitro embryonic development. They, they differentiate into endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm derivatives. So of course, you don't have a head and a tail, but you have and you know you, you can get neurons and endothelial cells and you know whatever you, you can think about. So it's a simple simple way to see uh, what type of effect something that you put up here can have on what is down here. So this is how the these trophoblast stem cell look like. They they grow in colonies and they express specific uh, uh, stem cell markers of the, the trophoblast lineage. But then if you grow them uh, with growing growth factors, you see that you can differentiate them into these big patches of syncytial cells. So the, the cells fuse together and they replicate basically the trophoblast layer, which makes the most of the, the placental barrier, okay? And we could see, that you know, as differentiation progresses, the stem cell markers go down, while the differentiation marker, this CNA, is actually a uh, uh, viral protein that uh, uh, is act was actually responsible for the uh, um, evolutionary uh, formation of the placenta, and so it's a good marker of the formation of this syncytial cells. So, uh, so we, we made our barrier, we measured the transepithelial electrical resistance to assess that actually we were making a barrier. And then we saw that 
uh, I don't know how much you can see it, but this is a staining for E. Cadiri. So we could see that the cell cell junctions were disappearing uh, when the cells were fusing together. Okay. And, and then we added up here some titania uh, nanoparticles. And then we could see that if no cells were put on top of the, the filter, so we had holes and the particles could go through, at a certain point, we were reaching a sort of an equilibrium between what was on top and what was at the bottom. While if we were putting the cells on top, you can see that very little titania was going across. So there was no detectable passage of the particles. Then we differentiated our embryoid bodies and we characterized the expression of specific markers. So these are stem cell markers that go down as differentiation progresses. Well, this is actually a marker of the endoderm to show, you know, to know exactly how the time course was going on. So then we chose this uh, time point and we added titania to see uh, what the effect was. And we could see that the titania dioxide particles were actually maintaining high the levels of the stem cell markers and were impairing the the expression of the differentiation marker. So the, the, the uh, development was, in, in this case, was impaired. So then we combined the, the two um, cell types together. And basically, I think, oops, sorry. And you can see, basically, if you look, I don't know. Oh, maybe I touched here. <laughs> so now, how do I go back? Right, right. But that, that's fine. I mean, I think you can still see. Oh, OK, it worked. Uh, so if you just look at the last four columns of the graphs, you can see that basically when the cells are up there so that the, the, the barrier is active, uh, the impairment in the expression of uh, the stem cell markers and of the differentiation market is actually blocked. So, so this tells us that in this case, at least in this model, we need to have a direct contact of the particles with the, with the, the, the developing simulated feeders which again means that there is a dose dependency on the effect. Okay. We, we actually did um, um, ICPMS analysis to know how much of the particles were moving from one compartment to the other, and we could see very, very little uh, in the lower compartment. So that was, you know. So what are we doing now is we have humanized. So what I just showed you was done with uh, mouse cells. So we took the mouse pre-implantation embryos, we developed our stem cell, uh, tropoblast stem cells uh, and the, the ES cells. So we uh, got uh, uh, tropo human tropoblast stem cells from Japan and we are basically humanizing now the model. So we are using uh, IPS cells to make the embryoid bodies, so human IPS cells, and we are replacing the mouse cells with the human trophoblast cells. Uh, so we have already preliminary experiments, but I'm not going to show them to you because they are preliminary. We want to be sure we are actually also including endothelial cells. So we immortalized uh, human primary endothelial cells we uh, uh, isolated from term placentas and uh, we are culturing them on the lower compartment. And together with a group in our um, school of engineering, we are now uh, trying to go into chip because it's very much on fashion at the moment, but also because it allows you to use very little amount of cells. And so when you deal with human cells, especially with primary human cells, it's a bit tricky 
you know, to have huge amounts. So we actually get uh, endo endometrial biopsies from, from our hospital and we isolate endometrial stromal cells and we want to study uh, the migration of trophoblast cells toward the endometrial cells to, to re reproduce the very early stages of embryonic uh, uh, development or better of implantation to see, for example, in pathological conditions like, you know, for example, a recurrent pregnancy loss, uh, if you know, we can identify specific pathways in the endometrial cells which are responsible for, for the, the condition. And, and, to, and you know, we want to see how the, the uh, trophoblast cells respond to, to this uh, endometrial cells. And so that's basically it. I mean, this is the School of Medicine at the University of Tor Vergara. So my lab is somewhere in the back of this tower. Um, and these are the people that contributed over the years. I mean, Fleming and uh, Professor Wolfgang Freiling were precious for the, the Silver study. And, um, that's it. Well, time, they have to go to class instead. Let's open the floor for, for questions for both Fleming and, and Luisa. And we start from the edge. George. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, both of you, for the great uh, presentations. This is really impressive work. I have uh, a couple of questions on uh, Fleming's uh, presentation, as I have worked mostly on black carbon. But actually, I would start from the second part that we also discussed yesterday, yesterday regarding the aircraft black carbon emissions. So if I understood well, uh, you separated uh, the aircraft emissions from the road uh, transportation emissions based on the size, right? Yep. Uh, and you said that, that if they are above 50 nanometers, it's from road. If it's below 20 nanometers, it's pro from aircrafts. Uh, I mean, I have seen though from different aircraft engine operation conditions, they can go like 30, 40 nanometers. So how much would your conclusions change if you put the threshold for aircraft uh, black carbon emissions up to 50 nanometers, not beyond just, let's say, if they are smaller than 50, not 20, as you put it. Okay, so, so we've, done, we've done that. I mean, it's, it's not that, there's nothing in between there. Yeah. But we kind of artificially took that cut off to allow for good statistics. But there is, there is certainly, but the distribution is wider than yeah. that. But the majority will be part of the higher between 10. This a tail that feeds into large particles of water. Uh, depending a little bit on where you stand. I mean, if you, if you I, we, we were quite close to takeoff. Takeoff really produces the very small particles. Landing would be a little bit different. Landing has, then they, they grow a little bit more size because of the difference in dust settings at the end. They also have more organics uh, compared to road emissions uh, during landing. So this would yeah. also change. So, so <clears throat> we, and we've done another paper on the source report, where we also included information about lights and traffic flow, etc. Uh, but eventually, I mean, the, the problem is there's no good chemical marker for aviation versus this. Maybe yeah. you can some, find something in, in the oil, in the oil. Of AVL, the turbine engine is different than one from road vehicles, but we didn't, we didn't go that far because it certainly wasn't designed to be sport. Chemistries are the same or more or less the same or the, the, the oils? You mean the, the, between the 50 nanometer and above? No, no, there's, there's, there's I mean, those uh, from, from turbine engines, they are often even, even not salt, they're soil they solubles. That's its condensation kind of stuff. That's why they are not also show up in black carbon. Yes. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. More Maybe questions. Another question uh, on the first part with the gold nanoparticles that you used for detection. If I understood well, these were commercial gold nanoparticles that were spherical, right? Well, no, we generate them ourselves. We use this part generation technique. Ah, from uh, Smith Todd's uh, group or uh... Uh, the more advanced version. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, then, uh, so I guess they were also aggregated, so they were more similar to black carbon. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Very nice. 
Um, thank you both for the presentation. I was wondering for the in vitro trans well model, is there a way to mimic multiple syncytotrophoblast layers? Because in the human, I believe there's more than in the rodent. So does that account for multiple layers to go past? So in humans, uh, depending on when you look at the placenta, I mean, if it's in, like in the first trimester, you have basically two, only two layers of trophoblast. So this in situ, which makes the, the, the real barrier and the cytotrophoblast are maybe. But if you go further uh, up in gestation, like if you go to a term, then the layer underneath becomes absolutely discontinuous. You just have few cells. So really the barrier is only made by the syncytium trophoblast cell. So it's only one layer. And then you have the Peter capillary is almost in contact. So the barrier, I mean, again, if you, if you mimic, more toward the end of gestation, the barrier is made by one layer of syncytium trophoblast cells and endothelial cells of the fibrous capillary. Okay. So, so, I mean, you can make as many layers as if you, for example, if you use the viewer cells, with the viewer cells, that's the problem because they keep proliferating and so they, you know, they pile up and they make several okay. layers. But that's not what it is in reality. Thank you. Yeah, maybe go ahead. Uh, it's a really interesting model, that you have, and thank you for coming to present to us. I really enjoy seeing what you're doing. Question about the new model that you were presenting, specifically about the primary endothelial cells. Endothelial cells are so challenging to get to work in a primary system because of all the mechanotransduction that they're testing to. Pressures, flows. Yeah. How are you planning for those? So that's why. Uh, so one idea with the um, organ on chip is actually that if you use that, you can have a flow. You can simulate a flow of, of fluid going into the chamber, and so in that way you would stimulate the cells, the endothelial cells. Otherwise, you know. That's, no, I mean, that's, of course, that's the limit anyway of, of an in vitro model, that you cannot replicate the entire physiology of, of the system. However, I mean, if you want to do study in humans, there's not much more you can do, <laughs> unless you want to go to jail. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you again uh, for both of your talks. Very interesting, very important work. I have a question about the airport study with the ultrafine particles. You mentioned that the ultrafine particles that come from aircraft, they grow slower than um, diesel, diesel or um, truck traffic particles. I'm not familiar with that. Are you able to explain a little bit more about that? No, and then point to Phil because <laughs> I'm a toxicologist, so this is the observation that we have. <laughs> Very difficult to explain why why that is. But maybe uh, or go ahead. I mean, uh, I would attribute this to so-called uh, coagulation rate, as we say, or how fast they collide with each other to grow. So the smaller they are, and also the smaller concentration they are, the slower you know the collisions will happen. So it would take more have more time for them to collide with each other and form larger and larger particles. Does it make sense? I guess. Um, from these or from um, airplanes, are they producing more particles in comparison to? Less and smaller. Okay. So these are typically produce particles with a mean or median around like 100 nanometers or 80 to 100. While as uh, Professor Casse also said, typically aircraft should have black carbon emissions have a size between 10 to 20 nanometers, up to 30 at most, not, uh, not larger. So, and also smaller concentration. Yeah. So for this reason, their growth rate is uh, much smaller. Does it make uh, yes. more sense? Thank you. Our chemistry are also different. Yes. Um, With the gases, uh, the condensation, the gases of emissions. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I haven't studied uh, the literature for uh, en uh, jet engine emissions. I mean, and George actually did uh, quite well. Actually, we have a part from the fourth floor here that we're making uh, this kind of particles. Um, but my understanding is organic content and pHs um, for the jet engines are higher, 
uh, than the. Um, it is seemed to have a sulfur yeah. core rather than a carbonaceous core. Yeah, sulfur mm -hmm. core. And I'm sorry, with it. So, uh, yeah, but it is a very interesting study, uh, which I was a little bit confused that you didn't see effects. I would expect the higher uh, reactivity of the jet engine particles, but. Well, these are healthy young volunteers. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and also, it's a short term order. So. It's only two hours. Oh, okay. it's only five hours. So. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Uh, yeah. yeah very quickly. You mentioned the lung being a long term reservoir for slow release. That's the that is my hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, so my question if you could stop the exposure, how long do you think would this reservoir this with um, this well, release well, continue and where are the reservoir cells? Or what are the reservoir cells? You think of macrophages? No, I think that there is no particles in general. I mean, that could be that they're in the interstitial spaces. So it's. Okay. It's not that they accumulate a lot in macrophages that are mobilized. You see that in rodents, they in particular rats, they accumulate in macrophages, macrophages immobilize, they stay as long, but they're not really released anymore. But for those parts, I think they end up in the interstitial. And from there, they're slowly moving towards the circulation. But you see this can over three months get still detect them. Lymph nodes. Well, we haven't. Done that analysis in units. No, so I don't. Know. But solubility also matters. It's yeah. clear. Yeah. So. No, yes. Yeah. Any question mm -hmm. about the gold inoculation study? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> how long uh, after exposure uh, did you measure the peak? Uh, the, the accumulation of the particles in the blood, how long after exposure does it get to the peak? So that's 28 days, 28 days. And then we still see after three months, we can detect them in urine, but the peak in blood was at 28 days. 28 yeah. days. Yeah. Any, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, just as an idea, again, about the gold, um, because the surface chemistry might matter, right? Yeah. So would it make sense or would it be uh, of interest to, instead of using gold nanoparticles and aggregates, to use carbon-coated gold so that uh, we can simulate, let's say, the surface chemistry of black carbon? Absolutely. Because we have this capability upstairs, we can produce gold aggregates with similar morphology to black carbon and we can coat them with thin layers of carbon. Uh, yeah. So would that... Can demonstrate that they're not released and yes. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so Fleming, actually, actually, we, we, we have to mention that we we work with with cardiologists in Edinburgh. Right? They are responsible for doing all the health observations. But we even they even have now a mission to do an exposure in pregnant women uh, that want to go up for abortion the next day. So this is kind of the ethical edge that we are reaching. <laughs> so I'm, well, I'm not sure if we want to do this, but yeah. So I, I mean, uh, since you're here, we'll take your brain. A bunch of young faculty, including Memo Doran uh, here in the audience, yeah. and Oman with Foster recently came to join us here. Uh, we're switching gears and we're studying uh, wildfire emitted nanoparticles, mm -hmm. which uh, again the chemistries are pretty unique um, yeah. and uh, there is also a chamber here i don't think we showed it to you it's in a controlled environmental facility it's a room side chamber which enables us to uh, control also temperature rf mean the arching rates and simulate indoor environments and they are uh, that Facility actually currently is also connected to a diesel generator, and now we are trying to connect to a couple other um, exposure platforms that we have in the center that enable us to generate wildfire emissions and carbon black and mobile source emissions and expose people. So, yeah. but coming back to the wildfire emitted now, particles, uh, in terms of endpoints, uh, you know, shall we? Focus on the same endpoints, cardiovascular effects. Is it something else you'll advise all of us to? Well, certainly, focus the cardiovascular effect, but also neurological. Yeah. 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 So, so that's that's another area that we're slowly getting into. Uh, yeah. uh, the you know, Gay is also working on that that topic, and uh, mentioned yeah. that yesterday they certainly do in vitro, in vitro, but 
also working that in uh, human studies division. Yes. And the, even the study complex pictures. I mean, we can mix yeah. this. No, you have more controls. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from online? I don't know how to do that, to be honest. I can ask them to unmute. If uh, they want okay, if, if anybody's online and wants to ask our speakers any question, unmute your mic and produce yourself and, and ask the question. Okay, yes, there's nobody left there. Let me ask another one. Um, okay, well, let me ask you, uh, Fleming a question because we, all of us, will be studying and discussing ultrafine particles uh, for quite some time, right? Um, so the EPA level here and also in Europe, but we still, I think, we we are stuck on the standard, which is a PM two point five standard, which is more on the mass rather than the uh, other characteristics of ultrafine uh, particles. Do you see any movement in Europe? I don't see anything in this country in terms of um, introducing a, an ultrafine particle standard. Well, they are introducing uh, yeah. standards for emissions. Eh? So emissions, the emissions will be controlled based on particle numbers, and that's mostly ultrafine, of course. So for for um, traffic, uh, but also for stationary sources. But in terms of air quality, um, you know that is basically relying on good epidemiology. And if there's no exposure data because there's no monitoring, it becomes very problematic to, to do the epidemiology. So that, that is now, we see that the European, European Commission, but also the, the member states will install now monitoring stations to get more data on the fines and, and supplement that with uh monitoring and then you regression modeling or whatever uh on, on the other end you would say um both vines are part of the pm 2.5 mixture so how dangerous will that be compared to pm 2.5 as a whole and so um yeah and if you control pm 2.5 you're most likely also controlling all and not necessarily not necessarily in my yeah. mass uh, yeah. Uh, sure. Now the cameras. I, I would just comment that the outdoor to indoor transport of ultrafines is significantly less efficient than the outdoor to indoor transport of PM 2.5. And, uh, and so I think when we, we want to keep that in mind as well when we consider total exposure to PM of outdoor origin. And, and I think an important question in the case of ultrafine particles. Uh, going back to, to your point regarding source and toxicity is how does the toxicity of indoor ultrafine particles compare to the toxicity of outdoor ultrafine particles? Yeah. And I think we have more of a differentiation in terms of sources looking at ultrafine particles than we do PM 2.5 regarding that. Definitely. Yeah. And, but and indoor chemistries are also different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we, we talked about yesterday, we also know that. Here, EPA is not responsible for indoor air. And that's the same in many countries. Who's feeling responsible for indoor air quality unless it's occupational? Yeah. Nobody. But EPA can say something about indoor sources if the indoor source influences outdoor air, right. which is not the case for no, outdoor not, not, not no. to that extent that it would worry. I mean, yeah. the other way around would be something, but uh, yeah. Yeah, cool. I mean, yeah, just about the translocation uh, to the brain, you mentioned that there are results. Uh, and I wonder what method used to study, if you used to study the translocation to the brain. Uh, a single part of ISP natural nanomaterials, for instance. Uh, Animal studies, not humans. No, not humans. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that, that would be. Yeah, good or bad or there are people that give their body when they're asking away two signs and then you can go to articles and retrieve issues but you don't know the source you can see if you can identify the particles but you don't know what the exposure history mm -hmm. be. Yeah, yeah. 
I actually have a question about how nanoparticles affect um, embryonic stem cell. So we said one of the immediate effects was like death or like embryonic development, and like long term was like low birth weight. So I wanted to know if there was any like studies on like the neurological impact post birth, because of course that's like a big part of embryonic development. So is there anything on that? Yes. So yes. Well, there are there are um, animal studies in which. The yeah, can you repeat? Second. Oh, so shh, okay, yes. So the 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 question was was asked regarding the if there are informations on uh, uh, neurodevelopment, right? So effect on on the brain uh, following the exposure in, during pregnancy to nanoparticles. So yes, there are there are actually. I would say they started already 15, 20 years ago, uh, uh, identifying the, the effect uh, uh, in neurobehavioral impairment following maternal exposure to, to the particles. And there are several studies which actually show, uh, in some cases, they even claim uh, uh, um, all these spectrum disorders associated to maternal exposure to, to nanoparticles. So yes. OK, I, I guess uh, we need to stop it here. Um, thank you all, especially the students at the during our seminar, and look forward to see you hopefully again. And thank you, Fleming. Thank you, uh, thank you. Lisa. For Thank you.